and hello everyone good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you're uh, calling in from dialing in from around the world i see that uh, you're already a very problem solving kind of audience uh, apologies the chat box wasn't working when we invited you to use it but you figured it out and been posting where you're from uh, in the uh, in the q a in the meantime so i can see we have people coming in from all over the world it's fantastic to see you for the latest installment in our innovation at work webinar series deep dive uh, today we're going to be talking about a, a question that is uh, as important maybe more important than ever uh, and that is about organizational transformation and in particular thinking about that as uh really a, a, a way to both drive and implement innovation, or as uh, uh, Bill Fisher, who is joining me as our expert faculty member on, on the subject, has, has uh, styled it uh, the new innovation frontier, uh, which I think, I think says it all. So as I mentioned, I am joined today by uh, Bill Fisher, a senior lecturer at the MI Slo MIT Sloan School uh, of Management. Uh, I think you all uh, have obviously read his bio, uh, as part of the process of signing up for the webinar uh, today. But if we could advance the slides, please, still, uh, I would be happy to uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, Bill. He uh, is uh, uh, a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School, uh, and uh, he's an engineer by training uh, and also uh, spent much of his career uh, at a one of our partner institutions in some programs, uh, IMD uh, in Switzerland. Uh, but I'm delighted to say that for many years, Bill has also been teaching in a number of executive education programs uh, here uh, at the MIT uh, Sloan School, in addition to teaching in some other important institutions in the United States uh, and, and in Asia. Uh, he's also been recognized uh, by uh, organizations like the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame uh, in 2019, which seems such a long time ago now before the pandemic and before COVID, but really in many ways isn't. He was inducted into the Thinkers 50 uh, Hall of Fame, which uh, I think is a very appropriate rec recognition. And uh, very germane to the topic, Bill uh, leads a course uh, entitled Business Model Innovation for Organizational Transformation. Uh, and the next run of that course is coming up live online October the 12th to the 14th. Uh, so if you uh, are interested in what you hear Bill talking about today and would like to learn more about that course, we'll tell you a bit more about that, uh, that at the end. But for now, what I'd like to do in a few moments uh, is, is hand over to uh, to Bill. Uh, and so if we can uh, advance the slides, we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to cover. Uh, Bill is going to describe uh, some basic ideas about business model innovation. Uh, and really, uh, as is our want at MIT and at the Sloan School, uh, Bill will look at this from a very practical uh, perspective. How do we marry business model innovation and organizational transformation, uh, these two uh, complementary things we hope in order to gain competitive advantage that's what the story is all about uh, today uh, and we're also going to talk uh, with bill's help and think about uh, what is it about ourselves as leaders now leadership style uh, that really helps this process and enables it to be uh, successful so as we go along feel free to ask your questions in the q a tab uh, that will help us to sort through them and later on i'll get a chance to put some of those, your questions uh, to to bill Feel free to uh, make comments and add thoughts in the chat as well. I see that 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 is now uh, working, uh, and it's great to see some interaction uh, happening there. And just to get, you're already sort of saying a lot about where you're from, uh, but maybe I can ask you as we switch over to Bill's slides uh, to also in the chat, uh, feel free to share with us and with everyone else what are the big uh, organizational innovation challenge that that you're facing in your organization right now. Uh, and while you think about that and just put that in the chat, I will uh, hand over the stage to Bill uh, and he will go through some uh, some slides in a few moments and then I'll come back and help uh, moderate some discussion. So, uh, so Bill, uh, hopefully we'll get some people sharing their perspective in the chat on what their big challenge is. Uh, but in the meantime, let me hand it, hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, and thank you all for being with us. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, it's great to have a good group like this from all over. I see a couple fellow Swiss and some New Yorkers as well. That's That always makes the group interesting. Um, what I'd like to do is just tell you a little bit about um, what I see as a three or four, depending upon how you count, story that probably all of us at some point in our careers are going to have to face, not necessarily voluntarily, 
but because the forces of disruption around us are going to make it an imperative. Um, and, and they also form the background for this course, um, the structure, if you will, or the, or the framework. The first is context matters. You know, too often in our rush to, to solve problems or make moves or craft the next strategy, we forget to really look at what's going on around us, specifically in our industry or, or the arena that we're competing in. And so, so when I think about uh, business, model trans business model innovation and organizational transformation, the first thing I think was we have to establish you know, where we are in the competitive arena that we find ourselves in and what's likely to come be, become next. So we'll we'll spend some time on the whys because if you can't if you can't articulate why are we doing this, then it's a really hard sell when you're asking people to change what they do and how they do it. And so why matters. The second part, however, is what might we do as a result of this? And that, that's where business models become so useful because I think they provide um, an excellent way to think seriously, precisely, coherently about what might we do to, to improve our position. Um, so we see we're building a story. We've got a why and we've got a what, uh, the what being the response. And then the third piece is how are we going to make this work? I mean, you, you know, it, it, the first two are interesting, but if you can't answer the third one, which is really all about organizational transformation, then you've got, then you, th th then it doesn't really matter whether you do the first two or not. So the third one is given this new business model that we think might be um, relevant uh, for changing our position, improving our position in our industry, is our present organization fit for purpose? What, what do we have to do with our present way of working um, that, that has to change if we're, gonna, if we're going to give our business model the highest probability of success? So that's all about, not only about organizational structure, but really about culture itself, about what do we have to change and how do we have to work in order to make this work? And so, so I think right then and there, we have, a, we, have, we, have, we have a nice story that we could tell anybody quickly in order to gain support or, um, uh, or investment. Why? What, what are we, what, what, why is change eminent? What are we going to do about it? And how are we going to make it work? And, and, uh, and that's really the, the, the basis of what we're going to talk about with one addition, okay? And the addition is a recognition that what's going on around us today is truly different than what we've seen in the past. We, the, the expectations about customer experience are changing so fast and becoming so broad that we are finding more and more organizations relying on ecosystems rather than value chains to be able to go into an unknown future. And if you do that, then we really need to think about how do we rethink all of these questions, why, what, and how, in order to be able to cope in a world where um, access to unfamiliar expertise domains becomes ever more important. And so, I, you know, when we think about the three days of this program, I sort of think about three plus one. And, and because I think if we, if we leave out the ecosystem part, we're doing everybody our disservice because that's really going to be where the future is. So let me tell you a little bit about this. And you'll notice that if you have questions, I wanna re, 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 reinforce what Peter said, um, please feel free to use the Q&A tab. We will get through these in time to have a robust uh, question and answer session. So I promise you. So context matters. And, 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 and I typically rely on industry S-curves as the way to think about where we are. The decisions that you're going to make in the middle of an S-curve when you know the business and when you're probably successful and, and so you know the rules of the game and you understand the customers and you know how all of this works, there's, there's variance for sure, but really the goal in the, in, in the middle of the S-curve is to reduce that variance so that you can compete on the basis of price in a market full of products that pretty much, or services pretty much do the same thing. Um, and, and, and that those decisions and that decision-making approach has got to be fundamentally different than when you're at this end of the S-curve, when you're reaching late maturity, when frankly, you don't have an idea of what comes next. 
and where you have to make big choices without having confidence in the data or the assumptions that you would typically rely on. And so, and so we really need to think about how is our industry changing over time? Yes, it's about competing in a shared space, but, but no, and no firm has an S-curve of its own. This is an industry phenomenon, but we're really looking about trying to go from the uncertain to the unknown. And that can be every bit as forbidding as, as it sounds. The other thing that's going on, I think, is important to recognize is that you've got to be able to move from one S-curve to another if you're going to sustain your organization. And incidentally, if you're going to sustain your own career. And so how we do this becomes quite important. And jumping S-curves is not easy. So we can't just casually assume that you can come into office the next day and just get on with the next S-curve. We need to think about what does it mean and how to prepare for that. Um, I, I write an article, I write a column for Forbes, and recently I looked at three industries that are wildly different in an effort to say, you know, this could happen to you. It does, it's not just high tech, but if you look at the automotive industry and you think about electronic vehicles and autonomous vehicles, um, you know, that industry is, is changing rapidly, as rapidly as any industry today, and the stakes are big for the incumbent the successful, the presently successful incumbent market leaders who are falling, it seems, ever further behind a number of upstarts led by Tesla and, 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 and others. So disruption is there and pending. We can see it coming. We can see the everybody scrambling to get purchase on the next S-curve. And, and this course is very much about how do you do that successfully? But it's not just high tech. If you go to your supermarket and you take a look at the, the dairy section, particularly the dairy section, what you'll see is less cow and more plant. You know, plant-based alternative alt milk are disrupting an industry that's anything but high tech and is um, equally important to our lifestyles. And not only that, but the container manufacturers and all of the assembled participants in the value chain are finding collateral damage as a result of this. Or if you are in the hearing aid industry, particularly in North America, where you see an industry that was formerly high tech is now being challenged because of recent legislation, as recent as a week or two ago, which will change entry into the marketplace and allow a lot of people with, with um, a cheaper, or, but, but effective remedies to enter the industry, you'll see that the incumbent market leaders, these six firms, which really dominate 80% of the industry, they're in for a rude surprise unless they can scramble quickly to, 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 to face the, the, the insurgents. And in fact, it appears that at this point that they're choosing not to do that at all, which sort of leaves the doors open for um, a, a whole series of of invaders to come in. And these invaders include companies as sophisticated as Bose, Bose speakers, um, uh, Apple, you know, you, you, people who have been in the sound business one way or another and see this marketplace unfolding. So it's everywhere. It's high tech, it's low tech, it's, it's, it's electric vehicles, it's dairy, it's, it's hearing aids. The question isn't, are we gonna be disrupted? but when, or when is it coming for us? And business model innovation is one of, the, one of the fundamental reasons that the nature and cadence of innovation is changing in these industries. If it's the hottest thing around. If you look at the way in which out dining has changed with, um, with, with, with food delivery systems that hardly existed um, a few years ago, or Uber deciding that it's going to add planes and boats and trains and and hotels to, 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 to its value proposition. I mean, this is a fundamentally different business model. How do you pull that off? Or Volkswagen, which is moving from the people's car to deliberately choosing to compete in the high end um, se sectors of the marketplace, premium from people's car to premium car. That's a fundamental difference in the way in which they go to market. Or this morning in the, in the Wall Street Journal, Howard Schultz saying that Starbucks is going from the vision of only a decade ago, which was a third place 
homework Starbucks, a third place where you could go and watch skilled baristas produce their products in, a, in, in luxurious surroundings. And it, Starbucks would encourage you to stay around to a future where there'll be far fewer baristas and a lot more machines automating the, 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 the beverage production process and, and customers who are more involved in remote ordering payment and consumption of the product than lingering. And so what we'll see is a Starbucks in the future that will probably be quite different than, 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 it, has, than it is today. And they're opening two or three of these every day in North America for the next three years. Big changes, all of these business model innovation, it's everywhere. And it's probably, and it's changing industry after industry because business model changes allow you to get out and under the barriers to entry that, that technology and engineering formally posed. So you can be a group of people without those assets who are able to upset a market. Dollar Shave Club did that to the, the shaving market. If you think about the business model canvas, the other thing that's so interesting is assuming that this canvas represents most of the activities in a firm, we can see disruptive innovation starting everywhere. In every cell of the business model canvas, there's at least one high profile disruptor who has based their, their, their invasion of an established industry on the basis of business models rather than on the basis of traditional offerings. And what that tells me is innovation can begin everywhere. Any of us can be an innovator. Um, we really need to be able to build that competency or awareness into the way we think about our roles as leaders. Not that we have to be innovators, but we've got to be cheerleaders for innovation. We've got to understand how it works. We've got to make our business models flourish with innovation so that we can continually change the nature of the industry that we're in. But if you do that, how, how ready is your organizational culture for that? How ready are you for that? What are the choices that you might make? And so I want you to be able to think of yourselves as architects of innovation culture. Um, is our vision, is our vision precise enough and inspirational enough to engage our people? Do we have the skills and talent to be able to do this? Are we organizing the skills and talent in a way that allows them to do this? Do we work together in an effective fashion to get more out of our employees in a non-manipulative sense than, than we have in the past? And what about our values, our measures, and our rewards? What, how do they reinforce this whole thing? In fact, in the organizations that I think are the most interesting innovators around today, all of those choices are aimed at a vision. So the vision crafting is critically important and it needs to resonate with the value propositions that you're seeing in your, in your, in your business model. Um, but if, if, the, if these choices are not supporting the vision, you're gonna underperform. And not only do they have to support the vision, but they have to support each other. So, and typically these choices, skills and talent, hiring, organization, IT, processes, they're being made by a variety of different people at different times in different places within the same organization. So the coordination of this activity is going to become a major leadership challenge in the future. So that's what I see coming together in this program. Why do we have to change? What are we going to do about it? Business model. How are we going to make it work? Um, culture. And then finally, how do we take this into the future in a world of ecosystems where hyper-connectivity and um, ubiquitous connectivity with the, with the customer is making us uh, fundamentally change what it means to be close to a customer, customer and what it means to personalize um, value propositions and how we listen to what they want. So I am delighted that you're here. I would love to begin to get into questions and answers about this. This program is going to run October 12th to the 14th. I would love it if you were a part of it. And um, I'm going to stop sharing at this point and um, turn it over to um, Peter and see where we're going.
Thank you, Bill. And while you were talking, we've certainly been getting some uh, questions in the Q&A and comments in the chat. And everyone, please, please do keep those uh, coming and I'll do my best to uh, sort through and, and pull some out. So just listening to you uh, set, set out uh, this set of uh, opportunities, issues and questions, we did get already some questions from people like uh, Lee Bogner and there were a couple of other comments in the chat that were about this as well. You touched on this, that you know, to some extent, uh, how organizations and businesses you know, res respond to and or are the driver of you know, is seen as being a question you know, for, quote unquote, the leadership. Uh, you know, most of us you know, in reality are not um, Steve Jobs or the CEO uh, of, of our organization or the founder or so forth. Uh, and so that, you know, there are these questions about essentially amount to uh, where we're sitting, how do we, you know, how, how do we play a role? What is the role for people throughout the organization? And, and, and you know, to what extent do we need to be managing up essentially? How do we influence uh, our, our leaders? Another question, uh, and I'm just looking for who said it, um, but you'll, you'll recognize the question when you, you hear it was about digital savvy. Someone saying what their biggest challenge was when we were get, when getting going was you know, I'm in an industry where our leaders don't have the digital savviness they need to even understand the transformation that we uh, that, that, that we need to go through here. So what, what is it about you know, leaders and leadership and what can we all be doing to improve uh, the organizations that we're in in that respect? So, so I, I think those are absolutely valid questions that have to be confronted in a course like this, but, but in our professional careers as well. In terms of leadership, what, what, I, what, what I see happening is that so much of what's going on in terms of um, using the customer experience as the objective of what we're trying to do is leading to organizations getting closer to the customers and when they get closer to the customers, being able to respond faster. And the easiest way to do that is to redistribute power and authority within the organization closer to the customer. So, so I see, um, in many of the organizations I've worked over the, working with over the last two or three years, really radical redistribution of power closer to the customer, which means that it's no longer the province exclusively of top management, but now decisions, business model decisions are being made at, at much lower level, coordinated for sure, but, but there's much more autonomy being um, given to people close to the action. And I think if you do, and I think that's the right thing to do, incidentally, but I think what that means is that the organization, any organization, is going to have many more business models than they've had in the past because they're going to be regionally specific, or they're going to be product line specific, or they're going to be customer segment specific, and there's going to be a proliferation of business models. Good, more complex for sure, but I also think what that means is it's going to legitimize though people who are making those business models and are close to the action also being able to adjust the culture of the of the business unit that they're a part of so that it's um so that it's able to respond quicker to what's going on in the marketplace and otherwise I, this is a difficult battle because most organizations pride themselves on having one culture but the reality is if you're doing different things for different people at different times in different places, you know, over time you begin to have one culture, broadly speaking, but very different microcultures under that umbrella. And what we'll be talking about are decisions that you can make at almost any level in the organization to be able to support a business model. So I do think you have to have a story to be able to convince senior management that what you're doing makes sense. I think the why, what, and how is part of that story. I think when you leave these three days, you'll be able to tell a, um, a concise, coherent, and convincing story to people above you as to why these things have to happen. And then I think that um, if, you can, if, you're, if you're able to get that sort of legitimacy, then you can run with this and be able to make that work. I, I'm not, I hope that's answering the question. Uh, I think so, and and, and then some, and I'm sure it's uh, prompting some uh, some some more as well. A, a couple of questions that I saw in the chat earlier as well. I think Johan was one person uh, that that asked a version of this. Uh, were uh, I think relevant to that? I mean, oftentimes it seems like there's a tension 
between uh, exploration and exploitation, to use that that framing. Uh, the uh, somebody in one of the questions asked about you know how can we be ambidextrous, uh, and uh, th there's a tension between uh, when you look, you were giving the example of the S looking at the S curves uh, of of actually simultaneously uh, being able to uh, you know, deliver value to customers and generate profits for your for your investors and shareholders while also uh, being forward looking uh, and and uh, and driving these kinds of in innovations which ultimately could put your own cash cows out of business yeah. uh, so there's there's another dimension to the tension but what have you seen you know how are the companies that are doing this best uh, so, be able to both be profitable and be innovative so i so every organization has to manage its its present and its future right at the same time and um, every organization that I see is struggling to see how to do that best. Um, you clearly need the profits from the present in order to be able to fuel the future. But, but almost always, the, 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 the projects that I see being aimed at the future are so different from the projects that are being worked on in the present that the, that the cultures of those two units, whether they're whether, they're, whether anybody talks about it or not, fundamentally different. Um, the business models are also different. And so there is there's, um, uh, tension, suspicion, fear within the organizations that, 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 that are going through this. Most consultants will tell you, and I think they're right, that splitting the organization into present and future, splitting it um, physically, splitting it organizationally, splitting it spiritually, however you want to think about it, makes sense uh, because you you don't want to have the future in, ever present in the in the day to day vision of the people who are trying to um, who are effectively cash cows trying to make the 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 the, the, the resource generate the resources that will be spent by these other people. Um, but what I worry about in that situation is that are, are those organizations being sufficiently responsible to the people who are working in the present soon to become the past? Um, is there, is there, are, we, are we taking the lessons being learned from the organizations of working on the, the part of the organization working in the future and making sure that we are equipping the people who are working in the present to be able to survive in the next generation? Maybe with us, maybe not with us, but I think that we have to think about how do we build organizations with scalable learning so that the lessons that we're learning as we go into the unknown and, and work become part of the work repertoire of the people working in the present. Um, but but that, that's the most difficult question that I see in the organizations that I work with. How do we coordinate present and future? Um, how do we... Um, you know, how do we plan for the future and what's the role of the people working in the present in that future? And it's a huge issue. We'll spend a lot of time on that because I think there's several different ways to do this. Um, but I think the, the most important thing is that you worry about it, that, you, that you're conscious about it, that it's not left un, unthought about or un, unaddressed. Um, and so that the people who are, you, who you're at asking to, you know, it's it, what it is, is the present is variance reduction and the future is variance enlargement. Those two don't get together at all. So I think what you have to do is, is provide assurance to the people who are working today to continue to sustain the organization, that there is a future for them, either organizationally or in the skill-based training that they'll, that they'll get, sharing that they'll get. Yeah, I think that we would all, uh, sitting where we're sitting, agree with the importance of being human-centric Yes. Uh, thinking about the human capital aspects of this, so I'm happy to hear you uh, provide some framework for thinking about that. Uh, Louis uh, Louis Frota in the in the chat has actually made an observation germane to that. What you were just saying that uses the example of digital uh, and offline businesses that have maybe have a digital part or an offline part, and that to your point earlier, these are often deliberately have been separated, uh, and so they're not talking to each other. Uh, and uh, and so there isn't a kind of a universal embedding of the innovation opportunity. You know, I, I sort of uh, uh, once said to our team uh, in a meeting, you know, look, we're all digital now. Uh, 
uh, in, in some in some real way. Uh, Ivy Cross uh, uh, also asked a question or made the observation in, in the think the Q and A. Sometimes you know, it feels like we're constantly reinventing the way we work. It feels more that it's just a reaction. We're not being purposeful uh, about it. In what you're seeing, are we just going to be living in a world where this is all about reaction, or you know, is it realistic to to be purposeful in the way that Ivy uh, is asking for? And you know, to Louis's point, can we can we can we purposefully uh, cause these parts of the business and the organization that are not communicating to actually uh, be better integrated? Right. So so that's the cost of separating, right? And so and so while the while the the best not the best advice um, that you can give somebody at the moment is to split. It comes with significant costs, and if you're if you're unaware of those costs, if you don't appreciate them at a human level, you, you're in for another set of problems in the future. I I think that one of the problems that we have is that change is continuous, but organizational life is episodic. So innovation is taking place in our industry somewhere, someplace, all the time, twenty four seven. But but when we go to work. We have you know, Monday morning meetings, we have weekly reports, we have quarterly reviews, we have annual get togethers. And, and it's almost as if our, we're out of sync with the world around us right from the start because we, we're calendar based at work with milestones, but, it, but, but change is not, is not held hostage to those sorts of distortions. So I think one of the things we, we need to do is to build, um, a culture of an organization where change is continuous, where innovation is expected, not feared, and where um, and where we are change and where where, are, where where we're trying to change as fast as our customers' lives are changing. Um, if we don't do that, we'll always be behind. But of course, that's 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 a shock to most organizations. Who have, you know, the worst thing in the world that happens to me is that when you have a CEO in the classroom and she or he says, "Fellas." you know, suck it up. Once we get through with this, it'll be fine. Well, you know what? That's wrong. There's no, we'll never get through with this, right? We're, this'll never end. So I think changes need to be made purposeful and by purpose, not only our strategic purpose, our business purpose, but also purpose that speaks to what do we believe in as, as, as people within an organization? What do we believe about our coworkers? What do we believe about our customers? Well, you know, how charitable are we when we consider these other stakeholders in our lives? Um, and I think that we need to be faithful to those types of, of beliefs and they're not articulated enough anymore at all. Yeah, so we're going from uh, a situation where where changes could come in step functions to a situation where change is just a continuous uh, fact of life and you have to exist on that curve, which is getting steeper all the time. Uh, Robert uh, in the Q in, in the Q and A uh, asks a question about that. He's, you know, he agrees with you, I think, says the issue is the future is coming faster for more industries than ever before. It's an important, it's important he suggests to leverage technology uh, in how we respond to that. Uh, his question though is externally, how do we help transform the context so potential buyers tend to be trapped in their own preconceptions. Uh, and you know, what is there a way? It's a very interesting question, actually. How do we change the shape of the S-curve? You know, yeah. the, these S-curves, uh, you know, in business school, we're, we're pretty wedded to them. Uh, and uh, it's, it, it's quite robust, but actually it's a good question. Can we change the shape of the S-curve? And can we even change uh, from, an S -curve, from a series of S-curves where there is still this sense of step function changes uh, to a continuous model? And you know, what would that look like? Well, I think there is a continuous model. So, so I think that I think if you think about the customer experience, that it changes over time, and that change is um, is is rep is represented by changes in the generational S curves that support it. So, you know, we go from um, um, cell phones to smartphones, and and those are two fundamentally different S curves. You can tell you can tell they're fundamentally different because there are different players in the industry, right? The, the people who made cell phones really are no longer, for the most part, players in the smartphone business. And whatever comes next, we'll have a whole new set, most likely, of, 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 um, of players. I think what you wanna do is you wanna put your, your organization in a place where it is able to 
um, anticipate the future well enough so that it, it can participate. It can be an author in how that next S curve it, it takes place. Um, that's probably the best you can do. I, I don't think you can impose an S curve on an industry, but I think you can be an author if you move faster. But that means taking big risks at the end of your existing S curve, right? And somebody mentioned um, uh, cannibalizing your your existing uh, um, uh, cash flows. Absolutely. And, and so I think what we need to do is to give leaders, and remember, now I'm thinking about leader full organizations, where organizations have more people in in those organizations who think of themselves as leaders because they're they're in charge of a business model and they make cultural changes to support that business model. Um, now we have people thinking that they can also author, that they have a stake in what comes next, that they can play a role in authoring the, the, the future. They need to be, they need to be more experimental in how they work. And we'll talk about this. They need to be faster because most of those experiments are gonna go wrong. They need to be customer experience obsessed, centric. That needs to be the, 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 the other thing is I think they need to be, and this speaks to the business model, um, is they need to be more generous. They need to have more partners involved as partners, not as vendors. Um, because they have to, they have to access more unfamiliar expertise domains. So you know, I, I work with a company that makes um, uh, household appliances, stoves, refrigerators, things like that. You know, things we take for granted. Well, now that the Internet of Things is hitting the home, the customer no longer wants to know. You know how long is my refrigerator going to work? And ask that question every 10 or 15 years. The customer now is asking every day, what's in my refrigerator? Can, I'm at the store. What's in my refrigerator? What do I need? What can I do with the things in my refrigerator? Do you have a recipe for this? How can I cook? And that's a, that's a whole realm of you know, and this is a simple industry, right? That's a whole realm of questions that, that nobody in this industry has ever asked themselves. They just produced boxes, you know, and now they're being asked to be, um, because of their brands, to be the spokesperson who orchestrate a whole range of recipe writers and chefs and provisionists and, you know, ingredient producers and all of that. And so the customer experience is fundamentally different. They're no longer in the refrigerator business. They're in the, the dining experience business. And that's very, very different. And so you need more partners. And those partners have to be attracted to you because of what you offer them, not what you pay them. And so my, 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 the opportunities that are in it for them. And so my sense is that what we're going to see in the future is um, partners, the ecosystem partners, who are participating, co-creating a whole new generation of products and services on behalf of all of those companies and expecting a redistribution of revenues so that they share in the, or profits so they share in the outcome. So we used to, Peter, we used to talk about, for years, we used to talk about value creation and, and, value, and, and, and value capture. Who's creating the ideas and who's capturing the ideas? Typically, the latter were people with big brands and great distribution systems. But I think increasingly, we have to think about value distribution. Who do we share the value with so that we become an attractive partner for people with good ideas? Uh, that, that, that's really interesting to think about. And uh, at, at the same time, we've had a couple of questions from somebody who's, you know, you're giving examples of really a range of different industries uh, and, and approaches. but. Uh, Daniel has asked a couple of times uh, about the example of uh, companies that are in the luxury products business, uh, and you know what does business model uh, innovation and transformation potentially look like uh, it, when you're in a business which you know, fundamentally your customer behavior is is subjective and maybe subject to, uh, to to kind of kind of trend and fashion rather than uh, subject to sort of data driven optimization. Uh, for example, have you have you seen have you worked with any companies that uh, are facing those dilemmas? So, David, I, last week I spent part of last week arranging for the chief transformation officer of one of the world's largest luxury goods, you know, uh, combines with all those multiple brands 
uh, underneath it um, to visit the refrigerator factory that I just spoke about, because what he sees uh, in this case, uh, what, what, what he sees in the luxury goods product is that the digitalization of so much of their retail business is calling for a fundamental rethink of how they how they perceive the customer, how they respond to the customer, how they, you know, we go back to the question of how do you educate a customer? Who can we bring in partners we've never worked with before who have ideas nobody's ever thought of before and begin to really delight customers who are willing to pay luxury good prices? And then how do we do that without destroying our existing retail business? So I I, I think, I, 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 do, I have to tell you, to be honest, I really didn't think customer goods were, were, were relevant in this, but now I've become a believer listening to this fellow and, and what, what his plans are for his organization. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, just looking through some more some more questions. I want to make sure we got so many coming in. I want to make sure we uh, uh, we get through as many <laughs> as we can. Um, we have a few people actually who've been asking a version of this question. That's uh, they, they comment that particularly in their you know through the eyes of their CEOs uh, who've got half an eye perhaps always on the markets you know and and, and sort of market responses to their vision. Uh, that perhaps there's a confusion between business model innovation, business model transformation. And a specific form of that, which is digital transformation. Right. And I guess reading between the lines of these questions, people are suggesting, look, there's plenty of business model innovation that's not necessarily fundamentally at its heart a digital transformation story. Digital uh, technologies might play a role, uh, but they might not even play a role. Uh, yeah. you know, and what's your experience uh, of that? Is there a clarity between those two things, or are we just kind of digital washing everything? So, so I think digital transformation is a subset of business model transformation, but my digital transformation colleagues tell me that it's the other way around. Um, I, I think that um, the, the way I think about it is that it's it's not a digital trans. The mantra that we need to adopt, and, and when you come out of this course, the mantra is embedded in your head is outside in. And, and so what we need to be doing is adjusting ourselves to the customer experience. And, and so part of the customer experience is greater digitalization and expectations of greater digitalization. So if, if you're a um, automobile manufacturer in the future, who's gonna own your customer? Is it gonna be you with your well-known brand or is it gonna be um, Google or, or, or Siri or, you know, who's, are, are they going to switch systems when they move from the house to the to the car or how is that going to work where's their identity going to be so i think that that's an important digital question that really has to be part of the business model um uh, planning that you do and um and, and you can't not take that into account i also think that digitalization has given business models a great opportunity to come in because in the process of making, in the process of digital transformation, many of our offerings, traditional offerings can be made smarter. And once they're made smarter, then we have other opportunities to build value propositions around and generate new revenues. So, you know, so I think it works both ways. I think that digital transformation has facilitated business models, but business models have been, um, um, have been a very attractive way to legitimize digitalization as well. Great. That's very helpful. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to put a couple of questions together now that have just co that come in uh, and, and add some add my own spin to it. So uh, Rangini is asked about uh, how these apply these ideas apply in the healthcare sector. Rajesh is asked about how they apply in the financial services uh, sector. So you know, maybe, maybe I could sort of ask you to sort of expand a little bit on that and just say to what extent are the frameworks, the ideas that you're talking about here. Uh, it's sometimes you know very industry specific uh, or, or versus you know generalizable and, and useful uh, across a wide range of sectors. Well, so they're not. They're, so so our conversations are not industry specific, and um, we there's we do need to change the business model framework when we talk about NGOs, not for not not for profit organizations, government agencies, and things like that. But we have, um, we, we have business model canvases, if you will, for all of those types of organizations. So 
we have parallel conversations with groups working on um, non-for-profit and groups working on profit, and then conversations between the two, which is really quite, quite interesting because they do see the world in fundamentally different ways, but yet some of the things they see could be useful to, to, to each other. Um, in If I look at banking, which is very much for profit, at least where I'm from in Switzerland, um, the that's an industry that's under tremendous pressure from disruption. And a few years ago, Bill, Ga Bill Gates said, you know, the world will always need banking, you know, money transfer, savings management, wealth creation, things like that, but it may not need bankers. And I think what he was getting at was that if you, if you decompose the industry, there are wonderful opportunities for insurgents to come in and, and pick pieces of the industry away from the, the large successful banks and offer it in a much more effective and efficient way. Money transfer, for example, is being done much more um, um, effectively by small upstart companies that do only that and, and, and are able to tell you uh, actually, I worked with one of them, and their goal was to be able to tell you where your money was um, to the same extent that FedEx or Amazon can tell you where your where your products are at any point in time, which I, I found fascinating because usually between the time I put money into a transfer system and got it out, we lived in Switzerland in the U.S., it was essentially lost. You know, so so this was really this was really a great great insight. I think that what you'll see in the banking industry is a con acceleration of the desegmentation of the industry, the segmentation of the industry, so that the parts that are more digitally um, um, ad adaptable will probably be taken out of the portfolios of the large traditional banks because they can't move fast enough. Be Look, when you see industries fall apart, the problem usually isn't the technology. The problem more often than not is our organization. We're not fast enough. We're, we're, we're not, we don't talk to each other. We don't take, the, we don't have a sense of urgency. And, and so these, um, these small encouragement, single focus uh, com, uh, insurgents can pick an industry apart very easily. And we're seeing that in banking. Um, so I think the story is, is applicable in financial services, certainly for insurance as well, but it's gotta be, um, adjusted and the vocabulary has got to be different, but it's the, it's pretty much the same. In healthcare, I think that the COVID pandemic um, was a great revelation in how our business models and particularly customer centricity failed us in the in the healthcare sector. So we were completely inside out in the way we went about addressing uh, COVID in the early days of the experience. We worried about the, the hospital capacity. We worried about all sorts of things that were institutional rather than making it easy to identify, quickly identify and treat patients. And so I think that, you know, you can take um, maybe not so much the business model portion of the, of the material, but you can think about the organizational transformation. And in healthcare, we really it is ripe for, um, uh, for, for that type of transformation. I'm also seeing here in Manhattan, that every street now has a um, a small urgent care facility. You know, we used to call them docs in a box. You know, but it's a small office that that is replacing um, my traditional um, general practitioner. So the 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 character of the industry is changing, and uh, that's very much profit seeking. And they tend to do very well on the things that have high margins leaving the hospitals with the low margin items, which is not what we want from our hospitals. Are there any other industries that uh, we should be watching or that you think are, are, are ripe for these kinds of business model innovations? Well, I think air, air, airlines uh, are, are, you know, I, I was, in the last couple of weeks, both United Airlines and American Airlines in the United States have made lo relatively large investments in both, in both flying cars, that, you know, a generic term that I'm using for all sorts of uh, small um, uh, three-dimensional uh, transportation opportunities 
and supersonic aircraft at the other end. And I think what we're going to see is that there many of these airlines are going to reposition themselves along the customer journey rather than just one part and run it differently than they have in the past. Um, so that's one that one that comes to mind almost immediately. Look, look at what we're doing here, education as well, right? In terms of being able to use Zoom or in-class or hybrid types of offerings. Um, and I think what we'll see is that in, we'll, we'll, we'll move from talking about um, lifelong learning, which really was more a series of episodic interventions to more continuous learning. And that'll be very digital because that's the the, the, the best way to, to deal with that. So that'll need a fundamental digital um, transformation as well. Um, great, that's, uh, well, I'm happy to be working in an industry that, uh, that, that you're uh, uh, highlighting as being needing uh, and or possibly being a victim of, a victim of these uh, of, of these issues. Hopefully we're at, you know, in, in, in the productive part of that. I think our time is going to be drawing to a close soon, but this is a good time. Uh, Alir has asked a couple of times, and you've sort of touched on, uh, I think, answers to a question, but maybe we can focus in on it now. As she says, quite simply, what do we see? What do you see are the biggest impediments to to business transformation? Oh, oh, well, so the biggest trans is inertia. You know, it's it's the in particularly with something as intimate as my organization, my team, my my title, my business, it's very, very difficult to, um, um, to, 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 to get over that emotional barrier. Uh, but but I, I also am taking great um, comfort in the fact that as people give more autonomy to the workforce, the, the workforce um, you know, accepts it and runs with it. Here's what I'd like to leave you with. So much about the way we run businesses today is about hiring great people and turning them into average performers. And I think that organizational transformation gives us the opportunity to reverse that, to hire, you know, to, 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 to hire great people and make them extraordinary performers. Uh, but we have to change the organizational structure, less hierarchical, um, less bureaucratic um, th th than before. I think on on that note, uh, it's as if we planned it that way, and I promise you we didn't. But uh, our colleagues have put up a slide about two of your upcoming uh, courses, uh, driving strategic innovation. Uh, we've got one uh, next week. Running, uh, next week uh, here at MIT, and uh, there's a another version of that that will run uh, in the spring. More information on the website, uh, and also your business model innovation course that's running October 12th to the 14th. Just in the last couple of minutes, uh, is, is there anything uh, that you'd like to share about uh, what you cover in those courses that might be helpful to people who are struggling with the issues that you've been talking about today? Well, well they're, they're both very different. The, the, the Driving Strategic Innovation course is seven days, much longer, and deals a lot more with uh, partnering value chain issues, um, personal leadership styles for uh, going into the future, uh, marketing choices that are being made, as well as um, innovation practices. Business model uh, innovation for organizational transformation focuses on three things, business model, uh, organizational transformation, the why, why do we have to do this? And the fourth one, fourth is ecosystems. So much more intense on that. Great, thank you. That that's very helpful. And again, if anybody's interested in learning more about those courses, uh, you can see our website there as well, executive.mit.edu. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. Uh, it's been wonderful to have so much interaction and so many great questions. Um, sorry we didn't get to them all, but we'll uh, we'll be reading through them and putting them uh, also to Bill offline, and uh, the team will try to put together uh, a short blog article to cover any other things that we didn't uh, get to. Uh, and if that, as if that's not enough, uh, we've also co got coming up soon the next in our Innovation at Work webinar series, which will be about how to have difficult conversations with opposing viewpoints, uh, hosted by Kate Isaacs and Cara Penn. And who knows, maybe one of those difficult conversations people will be thinking about now is how do I talk to my boss about the ideas that we've just been learning about and uh, get them to uh, support me coming to learn more with, uh, with, with this uh, wonderful expert, Bill Fisher. Bill, thank you so much for spending uh, this time with us uh, on behalf of everyone who's been watching and all the people who will uh, no doubt watch the, the recording of this session uh, as well. It's always a pleasure uh, to get to uh, hear about your, your work and hear your ideas. I always learn a lot 
and, and I know everyone else did too. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I hope we'll see you uh, in future webinars and many of you uh, either online or on cam campus at MIT as uh, we all grapple with uh, our need to learn and innovate and not only get on that curve that Bill was talking about, but get ahead of the curve, uh, which I think is uh, where we all need to be aiming to be. Uh, thank you all again. Uh, it's been wonderful uh, talking with you, Bill, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing people again soon. Thank you all. Thanks, Peter.